So I sort of want to start off, I guess I have to start off with an easy one for you. Instagram for kids. <laughs> Not for my kids. Not for your kids. No. So talk a little bit about this, the idea of what Facebook is doing now, um, pulling back on the idea of teen toxicity and pausing. Can you talk a little bit about this issue and how you're thinking about it as a commissioner? Well, we are going to ask, um, everyone with that kind of service to make sort of a horizontal risk assessment. Is my services putting something at risk that is, you know, dear to us? That could be uh, democracy, uh, could be mental health. And if I find that as a business, I'll have the obligation to mitigate those risks. Right. Do you think they are doing a very good job of it? Well, you know, we would like things to solve itself. Right. That would be great. But uh, now we have, you know, important pieces of legislation in front of the European Parliament and the European Council. And of course, we wouldn't have done that if businesses, they were on the job themselves. All right, so talk about that legislation. We did an interview six months ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, talk about where they are, because not everything you've done has succeeded. They pushed mm -hmm. back rather heavily. They're focused on Lena Khan right now mm -hmm. um, in that regard. So talk about the legislation and where you think your weaknesses are and the successes of what you're doing. Well, I think the main weaknesses in any piece of legislation is whether or not it's implementable. So we're really trying to focus on, on bad behaviors that we know of from the antitrust cases or from unfair market practices. And uh, I'd say, you know, both Parliament and Council is quite enthusiastic about it. Uh, the French, they really pushing because they would want that to be one of the results of, uh, of their presidency. So if we are, you know, really hardworking and working for luck as well, then we may be able to pass it uh, the coming spring. So it would take effect by the 1st of January 2022. Explain what that these legislation is going to do. Well, it puts an obligation on what we call gatekeepers. And, and gatekeeper is sort of a, a term to say, well, you have that kind of power in the marketplace that basically you decide who can do business, who cannot. And uh, if you are then labeled a gatekeeper, you have a number of do's and a number of don'ts. Do's could be give people their data. Um, enable that there could be a second app store. Don'ts could be, don't lean in on other people in neighboring markets. Don't promote yourself. Be prudent. So a lot of the things we know from the antitrust work, to put that into legislation, so you have to abide to it at all times. And who gets to designate a gatekeeper? How are you going to decide this? Oh, you're going to be big. Uh, okay. It could be, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, end users, thousands and thousands of business users. And we have made sort of this grid to say, well, this is the proxy for the kind of market power that we're looking for. Do you feel, I want you to reflect on GDPR mm -hmm. and whether you think it's been successful. Some people feel like the big companies, they've only become more powerful, richer, more entrenched, and it's hurt the smaller companies. Talk a little bit about the success of that and whether what you would do differently now, thinking about what's happened since. I think the main success of, of GDPR is that now privacy is a thing. If, if we had not passed this kind of legislation, I think we would still be in the dark when it comes to having digital citizens' rights. And I think it's really important that we sort of enlarge our thinking about what are citizens' rights in a digital world, because it's not the same. So I think that's, that's the main success. Uh, where we still have a lot of work to do is to make it easier for the smaller business to live up to it. And we need the market to deliver better um, sort of privacy by default, uh, privacy enhancing solutions, 
Uh, we need more digital assistance to remember your cookie preferences uh, so that you don't have to be bothered all the time. Right. So when you think about this idea of introducing privacy, there still isn't privacy legislation in this country mm -hmm. where these companies exist. How do you look at the US, which has moved zero since you've been doing all this legislation? Well, I have, I have registered a lot of a movement in sort of in how you look at technology. Okay. When I was new in the job as commissioner for competition, uh, working up and down the hill with my first Google case under my arm, it was like, who's that crazy woman? Yeah. Um, now you have six, seven pieces of legislation tabled. They are. By, uh, by members of, uh, of uh, both uh, chambers. There is a completely different alignment of thinking so I think it's only a question of time before you'd see, you know, real alignment uh, between democracies on this planet, Europe, the US, India, Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, everyone is now coming on board. What does that look like then? What legislation has to be passed? Well, obviously we need privacy legislation. Every one of us yep. needs to have digital citizens' rights. Uh, second, I think it's, it's an absolute given that you must rein in uh, the big companies in order to have a contestable what market. What does that mean, rein in? Because you said you're not against big companies. You're against big companies who don't follow the rules. Exactly. Okay. And this is why, since it seems to be a bit difficult to figure out what are the rules, to make that so much clearer. Because what we see now is that the market is not contestable. This is why we call it a gatekeeper. Someone else than your success, your ingenuity, your services towards your customers is deciding whether or not you can find your customers. Right. And, and that is you know, the first thing in any fair market, that it's up to you. It's your marriage that decides whether or not I'm successful. Right. You're successful. So what has to be passed here? And when you say they're coming together, they have different attitudes, mm -hmm. but nothing actually passes. Nothing ever happens. Biden has named three people who you know well, mm -hmm. Tim Wu, Lena Khan, um, and John Cantor. When is the time when it actually happens here, when you look at it? Because you've got to work closely with them, presumably. Well, it's, it's difficult for me to say, because even though I, I watch quite a lot of, uh, of late night satire, still their exact timing and workings of, uh, of, of your democracy is really difficult for a European. It's really difficult for an American, go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy that you say that. Yeah. Um, so I, I won't you know, know your timing, but if I look at the proposals tabled, I'd find elements of, of our proposals in there as well. In more proposals, we have these, we have three main ones, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, and act on, on AI in order to be able to trust it. And I see the same thinking just in many more proposals. So what will be uh, sort of the next step in the process, I wouldn't know, but I see the willingness and also a bi bipartisan willingness that didn't exist before. So when you're looking at the impact of the pandemic, the only companies that came out better than ever and in fact stronger were tech companies. Mm -hmm. They're more powerful than ever. They're richer than ever. They have more lobbyists than ever. What, is that, what, can I, what does that pose for you as a regulator? Well, I think it was, there's another side to that coin as well. Because a lot of people all of a sudden realized, oh, in order for us to do our job, to make our business flourish, we're in the hands of giant companies. In order for our children to learn, we're in the hands of these companies. So I think it was part also of the effects of change public opinion, that there is a job that needs to get done by our legislator in order to get this right. Uh, and the second thing, of course, is in, in Europe, there are, there are huge differences. Of course, everyone in hospitality, they have suffered enormously. But a lot of business in, uh, in the manufacturing industry, you know, they have been doing quite well. Uh, and they are now in the process of digitalizing. So people also see that 
digitization is moving on. The next big chapter is opening. And that, of course, is also why the timing on making sure that the market is open and contestable, that timing is now. So when you look at some of the cases, I love your thoughts on, because you have legislation around app stores mm -hmm. and a point of view. The Apple epic fight here, you must be watching closely. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, what is, uh, I think for every one of us, if we're not happy with the prices or, or the choice in, in a store, we'd go to the store next door. That option you don't have on, on your phone. And um, we have uh, complaints about the, the conditions of the Apple App Store, both that you have to pay a fee of, of uh, 30%, also when, when Apple is competing with the services, and that you have these anti-steering provisions, so you cannot get in touch with your customers and say, oh, you can get this 30% cheaper by signing up somewhere else. So we follow, of course, very closely uh, what happens after the judgments, uh, both on, on the market definition, where we have a slightly different take on that, yeah. uh, but also uh, what will actually be the follow-up? Because I think the reading of the judgment from our side is that both parties uh, had a partly win. Yeah. So the really interesting thing for us is, now what? Will this judgment actually mean that some of these provisions, the fee, the anti-steering will go away, or, and that's open. So what do you think of the judgment that they're not a monopolist? Well, this is difficult for us to see because here there's a different legislation that we would have. And for us, that depends on the market because we'd say, well, um, this is an aftermarket. When you bought your phone, well, there's an aftermarket, and, and here the App Store has a monopoly, because you can, it's real, de facto monopoly, because it's really difficult to go somewhere else. So in the market definition, if, if you look at the, at the SO that we have sent, the statement of objection that we have sent to Apple, you'd find these differences uh, embedded. So when you think about what has to happen in these things, they will move along by cases and all kinds of mm -hmm. things. When you, one of the things you do a lot is fining and taxing, mm -hmm. some of which have been overturned. Mm -hmm. Do you have other tools because you, you've suffered losses? Yeah, I can tell you it's a different thing to think that you take a risk uh, of losing in court and then actually doing it. Yeah. Second part hurts much more. Um, so the cases uh, that we have lost, they are under appeal uh, in the European Court of Justice. So remains to be seen what will be the final outcome. Um, the thing is that for all these many businesses who pay their taxes, I think it's only fair that they see that we do what we can to make their competitors pay their taxes as well. Okay. Uh, and this is, of course, why we do what we can in the international negotiations. It will be really interesting to see if we can pull through uh, this autumn with an international agreement both on the floor. Right, Janet Yellen had talked about this. Yeah, both on the floor of corporate taxation, but also with the distribution of taxing rights so that businesses pay taxes where they create their value. Do you think her statements were superficial or real this time? Because this has not come out of the US, this idea about a global. No, but, you know, I don't know if I can, you know, pride myself of knowing her, but I have, I have met her and I find her to be, you know, genuine and truthful uh, in this. And you know, there has been a complete turnaround with the change of administration when it comes to saying it's important that you pay your taxes. So you have a US uh, EU inaugural meeting. Mm -hmm. of the, you're here for this, correct? The trade no, I'm here for you. OK, sorry. And the Trade and Technology Council is this week in Pittsburgh. Yeah. So what's the goal of this meeting? Right now? Again, this is the first time you've done this. Yeah, we, we've, we've not had such a thing before. And, uh, and the idea is to have sort of a high level forum where we can discuss things related to trade and technology right. and hopefully to find alignment. Uh, one of the things really dear to me is that we find alignment on uh, artificial intelligence. Because in order for that you know, enormous potential to be unleashed, we need to be able to trust it. And, and right now, I think there has been too many Cases where you see bias, where you see that the use cases, well, 
there was a discrimination against women, uh, people with a minority uh, background, and I think we need to move forward in democracies to change that, because otherwise artificial intelligence will be turned against us. Do you feel like it's too late in that area? There's only a few companies who control this. No, but it's, it's, it's indeed about time, because very soon it will be overdue, uh, also because we see different uses of, uh, of artificial intelligence, uses that we would think they are against the fundamentals of a democracy, where the starting point is the uh, integrity and the dignity of the individual. And, and it may sound trivial, but to put it into effect takes actually quite some ingenuity. Right. So when you look around at misinformation, disinformation, which has also grown mm -hmm. during the, this time it's the pandemic, or it was the election, what can regulators like you do? I find it impossible to figure out what to do here, except perhaps burn it down, saying this architecture is rotten. Let's start with another one. Do you think like that? I wouldn't be a very good regulator, obviously. No, I don't think like that. Uh, my first thought... That's because you knit. Go ahead. Yeah, but it makes you grounded. Okay. Um, no, my first thought is that humans have been lying probably even before we learned to speak with one another. You know, the mammoth is over there and then you're trying to get it yourself. Never successful. Also catching mammoths seems to be a teamwork. Um, but that being said, you know, the spreads and the scope of disinformation, of lying, is a completely different feature today than what, what it was just five, ten years ago. So what we are asking is to first, uh, to make a system that allows you to take down, but also to allow people to get back at you. Because obviously the gray zone is important. Everyone knows that we don't want child pornography or bomb recipes or excitement to terror. But the gray zone is the interesting um, territory uh, where platforms will have to do much more in order not only to take things down, but also allow people to say, well, this is hurtful, we know it, yes, but it is actually legal. And that is the push that we're doing right now with that piece of legislation called the Digital Services Act. You think that will be the solution because this stuff floods everywhere in every aspect. Now, they're all related to each mm. other, um, but I think it's quite difficult to shut down. How do you push back on the idea that it's censorship? Well, of course, we, we accept that some things decided in our democracy that we don't want it. We don't want child pornography. We don't want excitement to terrorism. We don't want hate speech because we think that uh, the dignity is important. That we do not call censorship. That, it, that we think is natural in a democracy that that kind of decisions can be made. So what we're trying to do is to say, well, in, in the gray zone between something, what is exactly hate speech? What is exactly excitement to terrorism? Here you need processes to enable people to come back if something has been taken down. But we also need that horizontal risk assessment, the services that I offer, is there a risk that they will be conquered by people who want to spread lies to actually de facto excite to terrorism, uh, that they pose a risk to people's mental health? Because then you have the responsibility to mitigate it in the way your platform is working. So but when they haven't done that, mm. they're interested in growth. Mm. They say people should do whatever they want. How do you change that attitude from your perspective? Well, only by, only by imposing this responsibility and making it enforceable, and when enforceable, uh, also to be able to, to hand out fines, and in repeated um, cases, also to do structural remedies, which basically means to say, well, you may have to uh, split up your company. They don't like that. Doesn't seem so, no. So do you think that's going to happen? Splitting up what you, that you have the political will or power to do so? Well, the reason why we have not been there yet is that we have not had the cases uh, to do it. And of course, I would like companies to follow the legislation rather than to be compete offenders 
and putting themselves in the territory where um, structural remedies splitting up would be the consideration. Because as it is now, we need real change as to how these services work. As you say, you know, the spread of disinformation and lying is epidemic. Have you, were you surprised by January 6th? By what? January 6th here. Yes, I, I was surprised. Why? I was, because the US to me is, a, is an old democracy. Of course, I see the debates about voting rights, uh, exclusion of, uh, of voters, but, but these are, are debates. It's a completely different thing to violently in, invade um, your, your democratic home. So do you put how much of, I don't want to say blame, because it's not quite right, how much of the impact of social media and technology had on that? and what's happening now when you look around. Of course it has an impact, but the other side is we were very happy with the average spring. We're very happy when people can use social media also to organize an opposition against a, a system that wants to control them. And this is why we have this idea that you need to assess the risk horizontally, but you also need to give people a way to get back at you if too much is taken down, to say, well, yes, what I say may be harmful to you. Uh, it's hurting, but it's legal. So it has its role. And, and that's the balance. These are really, really tricky issues. So when you look at what you've done, you became kind of a, I, I'm not saying you're a villain, because I don't think you are, but too, too tech, you were portrayed like that. You, you're quite reasonable, actually, in a lot of ways. What do you, when you look at that, why do you think that happened? The idea that you're sort of the tech killer. Well, I think it kind of comes with the job uh, as, uh, as commissioner for competition, but you know, basically I think our mission is so much bigger because to make sure that technology serves us, not only as consumers, but also as citizens, this is now. Because otherwise, our societies, they will just completely drift into a situation where the huge majority of us, we will just be pawns. We, we will not be part of the decision making. And this is why basically now democracy is, is saying this is, the, this is what we want. We want to take these decisions out of closed boardrooms and put them into democracy so that we can see societies develop by using tech and not because of tech. So when you look at somewhere like China, which is cracking down, mm -hmm. what do you think is happening there? Well, it's, it's quite opaque, uh, I must say, so it's, it's a bit tricky. But my general approach would be to, to let the Chinese be Chinese. I think I would be a very poor Chinese. Um, because they, both when they do antitrust, but also when they use technology, they have a different approach. Uh, you know, some of the ways they use technology are some of the ways that we want to make absolutely forbidden. Surveillance. Surveillance by remote biometric identification, the use of uh, social scoring uh, by states and, and governments, uh, the use of uh, subliminal uh, messaging. Because I think it's really important that we as citizens say, well, there is a use for technology and there is an area where there's no use for technology. So what they're doing, though, is cutting the power of technology. It was, it's sort of like you on steroids in a weird way, or Amy Klobuchar on steroids or something like that. Is there some things they're doing you think, I'd like to be able to do that? No, actually never, because one of our fundamentals is that um, our union is built on the rule of law. And no matter what you think about someone doing something illegal, or who might be doing something illegal, they have the right to defend themselves. And, and that's a fundamental. Of course, sometimes that slows us down, but it slows us down for the right reasons. And now, what I've learned in my first mandate as, as Commissioner for Competition is that specific law enforcement is not enough. We need to call in regulation 
for the two to work in combination. Otherwise, we'll not get it right. So when you look back um, on the things that you, uh, that you wish you had done differently in that regard, do you go back and correct it? Mm -hmm. You didn't, you had taxation, some of it worked, some of it didn't. GDPR, some of it worked, some of it didn't. If you'd go back and do that, what would you do differently? Well, it's, it's tricky to be specific, but I think I would have been bolder. Oh. Because we have so little time. Democracy is so fragile. We have so little time to get it right. And my fear is that citizens feel alienated. I'm not in control. I don't know what to do to get in control. And other, either I just throw myself completely into tech or I withdraw. And empowerment, to feel as a citizen empowered, I am in control, I know what I do, that's, that's the essence of a well-working society in my book. And here we just, we just click the boxes, we just let go, and we should not let go when it comes to something personal. Can you explain to people your use of technology? Oh, I use a lot of technology. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I use it uh, to wake me up in the morning. Uh, I use it for the news. I used to use it to stay connected with friends and, and family. What, what companies do you use? Oh, I use a lot of different companies. Um, and I also see what, how beneficial it is to be big. Because, you know, for instance, when I use another search engine than the, than the dominant one, I see that it's called take, Google. It's called Google, yes. But I would, you know, I don't think it should be a word. Okay. Um, so when I use another service, I see that it takes time for it to get to know me. Yeah. But I'm willing to invest that time, because I get a different sense of I'm in control. What about delivery, commerce? Yeah, I I do that a lot. So you use Amazon? No, I don't. Okay. Because you, you know there are other, other businesses. Yes, there are, I'm aware. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you use? Well, it's quite varied. Um, but, you know, we have so many smaller companies and they would use, uh, uh, there's a German delivery company, there is, uh, uh, there's a number of different companies and their service is impeccable. Impeccable, so you don't have to use Amazon. Do you do that as a matter of? Sometimes I, I need to, to do a bit more effort to find what I want. But then I get to know businesses that I would otherwise not have seen. Right. And for me, you know, uh, convenience is kind of a curiosity killer. That if you want to, if you want to get the most, also what the, the, the web can offer, you need to invest a bit of curiosity to get there. And convenience basically kills that. Do you think we spend too much time being convenient? Way too much time. And I think we would live or die to regret it. Uh, because every time you get a bit resistant, at least that's how I feel it, I learn a bit. And I change my perspective. And I like that. I think uh, that is part of the meaning of life. So if you had to think of the one thing that tech people think about you that yeah, they get wrong, what would it be? Well, I'm, actually, I'm not a tech person. I, have, I don't know how to code. I took a course in the last millennium. I have forgotten all about it. I think the, the important thing here is that it's about society and, and the use of technology and widening the community and that it's 100% legitimate in a democracy that those of us who play a role in there, that it's a legitimate role. So are you hopeful? Are you not hopeful? It's gotten worse since we met. I know, but you know, I think optimism is the only realistic option. Really? Yeah, because pessimists never get anything done. What if, if you're an optimistic pessimist? <laughs> well, I think that's a workable position as well. Okay, but do you feel um, exhausted by it? I'm always curious, because... No, I feel encouraged. Wow. We, ha we have things to do, and you know, the community is growing. More and more people realize both the amazing things you can do with technology, but also the absolute need for us as, as citizens, as consumers, 
to say, well, this is the society we want to live in. All right, last question. You're working on AI, you're working on a bunch of uh, privacy. What is the thing you're, is in the corner of your eye that you have to pay attention to? Is it healthcare? Is it transportation? Um, what worries you? Are you like, huh, I'm a little bit nervous about this? Well, since we, you know, we would have a surveillance of all these different markets, what worries me is, is if we forget how it's like to be humans together. And that has nothing to do with the market as such, only when that becomes more and more digital. Well, do you know how to get into a shop and get proper service and feel I'm now a consumer? And do we know how to come together and build common culture instead of just sitting at home be behind our screens? You know, not only do I love you and I want to come here because of that, but I also want to come here because it's real. It's people coming together. And, and I think that is what we should be worried about. You think people are going to go back to work, go back to society? This has been the biggest experiment in history, and it worked. Yeah, and that's great. It's really, really great. And I think probably we could save every second business chip, ch trip, but we need to do the others because we need to be with one another. We need to see the, the gestures and, uh, and, and the eyes and the smiles because, you know, Zoom, WebEx, Skype, whatever they are called. Do you use any of them? Of course I do. Okay. Of course I do. But my fear is that the risk was bigger of losing your sense of humor than your, use, your, your sense of smell and taste in this pandemic. Because, ah, the timing disappears. Someone is always muted. And so there's never a feedback, which also means that brainstorming disappears, that negotiation becomes really, really difficult. Because these are all, you know, core human competences. And we need to come together to train it, to be able to do it. All right. Thank you, Marie. You got a question? Regulations that the EU is proposing may seem, you know, really important. We want safety. We want this. But other countries, Russia is using it to crack down on criticism. Other countries are shutting off the whole internet. Um, is there a need for some sort of global agreement on what, you know, the is the internet a fundamental right, and how do you take the good? How do you keep it open and, and unique and the worldwide while still having regulations? Satya Nadella called it a Geneva Convention for DEC. Yeah, I think, I think we do, and we're pushing to get there. We will try this autumn to make sort of uh, a set of digital rights. We have fundamental rights, but we need to enlarge that. And then we need democracies all over the planet to work together to create something like you're asking for. So, you know, I have a uh, close conversation with my uh, Indian colleagues, with Japanese colleagues. We keep track of what is going on in Australia. And, and we see more and more alignment. And of course, I do hope that within this framework of the Tech and Technology Council, that the US and, and Europe can sort of set the direction so that we get it right. Thank you. OK, over here. Hi, thanks so much for being here and for your leadership on this. Um, question about uh, streaming. The streaming market here in the United States is growing rapidly, growing internationally. Curious, is the commission uh, committed to preserving competition for streaming as it has done so effectively well in other digital markets? Well, in that, I can, I can answer without any kind of long, detailed, you know, if and then. The answer is yes. It's pretty competitive right now, though, right? Correct? Yeah, but it has to be competitive. One of the worries that we have, of course, is that when we all get to, to, to streaming, how to get news to you. Because in old flow TV days, we would be ready, having done the dishes, made coffee, ready with cookies, the real type. And, uh, and we would see the news, and we would see the series, and we would see you know, a film, and it would all be there for you. So how to get the news to you, you know, old school, curated, journalistically uh, driven news how to get that to you, because that's the other part of yeah. democracy. You need independent journalism. Also, when it's really, really inconvenient for those in power. That's, that's a worry when we see the streaming development. 
but we need that to stay competitive because that gives us the best results. Um, Madam Vice President, how uh, it's been over a decade since the European Commission opened uh, the original search investigation of Google, and Google's market power is unchanged. If anything, it's, it's uh, more deeply entrenched. You said that uh, if you could have a do-over, uh, generally you would be bolder, but specifically on Google, what advice would you give to your U.S. counterparts, the state attorneys general and DOJ, as they prepare one, uh, I think there's now four trials that are uh, about to begin on this, and um, and how do you and then generally how do you anticipate kind of collaborating with Jonathan Cantor and Lena Khan? Well, as said uh, to Karen, one of the things I learned was that sort of the specific case by case competition law enforcement is not enough because we see maybe not exactly the same, but then kind of the same maneuvering. Uh, we just made a sector inquiry to look into Internet of Things for consumers. Uh, and we see, for instance, with voice assistance, we see sort of similar trends as we see in the specific competition cases. And, and I don't think we can go to where we want to go without the cases, but it's not enough. We need regulation as well. The two must help one another, and it must come in parallel, because otherwise we lose way too much time. Uh, I'm really, you know, encouraged, looking forward uh, to also meet in person uh, my new colleagues uh, over here. And I think the signaling from President Biden with his executive order on competition, I think that kind of signaling is what is encouraging everyone who thinks that fair competition should be the rule in the marketplace. Okay, well, last question, because she's got to get on a plane. Great, I'm thank you very start. much. Um, David Shavern at the News Media Alliance, and thank you for the shout out for independent journalism. All right, make it uh, quick and then I can get to Shireen quick. quick okay, uh, real quick. Um, responsibility for algorithmic decision making. So when you, uh, when we, you're the news feed, Facebook decides what is seen, Google decides what's seen, the search result, that is their decisions. Often automated decisions, but theirs, not yours or mine. The, the question, the debate here about who's, what responsibilities attach to those decisions is somewhat warped by 230, but you don't get that, you don't have 230 in Europe, and I was wondering if there's a way you can talk about how you think about their responsibility for their decisions. Well, I, I think they have responsibilities both in the specifics, but also horizontally. Like if, if an algorithm decides what news to see, you see, well, the, the first thing is that you should be told. This is an algorithm building on what you saw before that shows you this. Second, uh, as said, this horizontal responsibility uh, and, and part of, of the questions to be asked here is, is, are we you know, chasing people down rabbit holes? Or are we giving them what an old school omnibus paper would give you, you know, insights on things you were never interested in? Uh, you know, I've learned so much about football by reading normal papers. I would never look for it myself. So now I take an interest. And I think that point is one of the points that has to be considered when you get this obligation to have a horizontal assessment as to how are my services actually working. When you get to that level, when your services become part of the infrastructure of society. You're not going to get me to like sports very quick. Yes, you've got to go. In light of the recent Wall Street Journal reporting mm -hmm. on Facebook withholding its internal research about the effects of its platform, um, has that changed your view of the company? And what should uh, regulators do when they feel that companies are not being forthcoming or even lying to politicians? Well, maybe I have not ever been a total fan. Um, and we have, we have quite um, uh, strong tools to ask for uh, information uh, when we do our casework. And it's because that we cannot do our casework in full respect of due process without also getting information from businesses. Uh, and I think it's really important when you have that kind of role that you are indeed very forthcoming with uh, your insights as to how things are working. 
um, we will be asking um, for more openness also when that wetted researchers can get the kind of, of data uh, that we're talking about here uh, in order to have a proper assessment uh, of what is on GoHoom and in order to evaluate if the businesses are living up to what hopefully will be their new obligations. Okay, great. Marie, thank you so much. We had a lot more questions. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you. you very much yes. for having me.